Well, good morning. It's nice to see all you guys. Um, some new faces, so that's good. You guys blessed us with a nice, beautiful, warm, sunny morning somewhere in the, hopefully in the United States. Um, we're not really getting partake in it yet, but we will, we will. So, this morning, I, I'm just blown away that the senior pastor gives up the pulpit for Easter morning, you know, I mean, that, that, uh, doesn't typically happen, but, uh, he's very humble, and I absolutely love that. Um, man, we do have some new faces. If you haven't heard me before, <clears throat> I can come across a little, a little rough sometimes. You might be like, what did he just say? Um, so if, if you disagree with anything, feel free to come up and chat with me afterwards. Um, I am married with three teenage daughters, so I'm really used to that. <laughs> so it won't offend me. They are all here this morning. Priceless purchase is, is what I titled this. And man, if you think about Resurrection Sunday, you think about this weekend that that uh, the world calls Easter weekend and and the things that have, have gone into it. This is, man, it's one of the most important times uh, that a Christian can celebrate. And we're going to break some of that down, but I want to start off with John 15, 13. And it's really a staple to this. It says, Greater love has no one than this, that he lays his life down for his friends. We're going to cover what Jesus Christ, the Son of the Most High God, did for you and me today. There's going to be some stuff that you've probably heard before. There may be some stuff that you haven't heard before. Or maybe it might be presented in a way that you haven't heard it presented. I ask that you, uh, that you just bear with me, that you try to take it in. If you want to take notes, take notes. If you've got your Bible... You know, you can, you can underline, highlight, mark in it. That's not a sin. As far as I know, it's not a sin. And uh, mine is marked all up, big time. But I just want to welcome you guys today to Church on the Rock. I want to welcome you uh, to celebrate Resurrection Sunday with us. We are really glad that you're here. And why are we here today? Why do people come on to church? But especially, why do we come on Resurrection Sunday? What he did on the cross for us, right? But why did he have to go to the cross for us? It's, it's because he wanted relationship with us. It's not so we can read all these cool stories in the Bible. That's a part of it. I love history, so I love digging into the stories. That's a part of it, but we do that so that we can get to know him better, so that we can develop a better, deeper relationship with him. So we are here specifically for relationship, and not just any relationship, a love relationship. You've got friends, you've got people that you work with, that, that uh, you have relationship with. It's like, hey man, good to see you, how you doing? You ask how you're doing as you're walking by, you're hoping that they don't respond. Um, you know, it's like, don't get too deep into this question. Okay. Like it's a, it's like saying hi, but this is totally different. This is this deep, passionate love relationship, you know, where, where you just meet somebody and you're, you're like, oh my gosh, I just can't wait to see them again. I can't wait to be by them and, and hold their hand. And, and I'm talking like my beautiful wife sitting here and it, it makes me think about, about her. But God, he created us. He knows you intimately, passionately, wants to be in relationship with you, but it's a two-way relationship. It's not just one way. It's both ways, and he wants you to want him too. So we're going to get into this a little bit. We're going to break that down. So this, this 
day represents, in my mind, it kind of represents like the real Valentine's Day. You know, we've got this Valentine's Day, but, uh, and you get to share it with maybe somebody that you love physically, but this is so much deeper than that. So it's, it's really like the real Valentine's Day. It's like the real Romeo and Juliet, the original Romeo and Juliet, you know, before Romeo and Juliet ever even existed. Any Shakespeare fans in here? I'm not, but I'm glad that you guys are. Um, simply, probably simply because I've never read it, um, but I have heard a lot about it. And it sounds kind of cool, but I do know about this one. And I don't mean to offend anybody, but I might, I might. Um, today is better than Christmas. And you might be going, why in the world does this dude think that today's better than Christmas? It's Easter. Like, what, what do you mean it's better than Christmas? Nobody buys me a bunch of presents on Easter. We go and hunt, hunt eggs that somebody hid out in the yard, you know? What makes this better? The whole fact that Christ came, that God sent his only son. That whole process and him having this, this miraculous birth from a virgin to be born in a stable and all the representation and stuff, that is stinking awesome. But it all was for this. The whole purpose is for today. Is for what we're celebrating right now. That's what it's all about. That's why today is better than Christmas. I might get into that a little bit more later. John 3, 16 through 21. I'm just going to cover 16 right now. But for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. We've all heard that. We've heard it a bunch, probably. Most everybody in here has heard that. But the wording of it, I don't know if anybody in here is like me, but wording means a lot to me. And the wording here, it's good. But whenever you hear stuff that, that doesn't really resonate with you, your mind just kind of poop, skips right over it. Mine does anyway. It's like, oh, that sounds cool. I don't even know what that means. What does this begotten mean? I don't, what's he talking about? Well, I want to break it down a little bit. This is, this is how my mind reads that same verse. God loves us so much that he gave us, all of us, everybody in here, you, me, all of us, his one and only son. He didn't just give him to us, but there's so much more behind that. But his son, Jesus, he sent him that whoever, whoever, anybody, whoever will truly believe that Jesus is the Son of God and accept him into their life, actually getting to know him, not just saying, hey, cool, Jesus, I believe you are who you say you are, awesome, and then leave it at that like that's, like that's all you need. I'm talking getting to know him. If you actually get to know him and love him, they will never be separated from God. But instead, they will get to live in relationship with him forever, for all of eternity. This life, this physical life, this isn't, this isn't it. When you die here, this isn't it. That's not it. You actually have an eternity. God loves you so much that he wanted to make a way that you can be in relationship with him, sharing time with him forever and ever. That's why he sent Jesus, okay? That's what today's all about. That's what it's all about. Let's pray for a second. Heavenly Father, thank you for your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I pray that you will open up our eyes, our minds, our hearts, our souls, our spirits today to be able to receive from you what you have for us today. 
Don't let us leave here unchanged, God. Don't let us leave here without a deeper, more intimate relationship with you, Father. Amen. All right, here's the key. Here's the key. John 3, 17 through 21 says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Does that go against like some maybe some thoughts that you've ever had? Maybe, maybe Satan has been trying to pump into your mind that the only reason Jesus came was to condemn you. You're not any good. You're just a sinner. We're all sinners, saved by grace. But this says that God did not send Jesus here to condemn us, but to save the world through him. That's, that's the whole point. That's the whole point. If we move on to verse 18, it says, Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they've not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict, John goes on. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world. Jesus has come into the world, but people love the darkness instead of the light. They love doing whatever they feel like doing. They love doing the things that just pleases their flesh, and they, they reject having a relationship with him. It says, because their deeds were evil. Their deeds were evil, so they rejected him. It says, everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. Have you ever been there? I've been there. You don't have to raise your hand. But I've been there, so I would assume you probably have too. You feel like, well, I don't want to go hang out, you know, at church. These people might, they might know what I do. They might, they might find out that, that I live this life of sin. Guess what? So has everybody else in here. <laughs> You're not alone. <laughs> Welcome. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. I think that we all lose that sometimes, right? We all are like, well... I can, I can do this over here. Nobody's going to know. <laughs> well, wrong. God knows everything that you do is in the sight of God. Everything. It doesn't matter if you're in your house alone, in the dark, in the basement, in the attic. I don't care. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter. If you're, if you're in a, a strip club or, or out on the street, it doesn't matter. God sees you. He sees you, even if nobody else does. But isn't it amazing that even knowing all this, even knowing all of this, God still sent Jesus because he wants a relationship with you. That's mind-blowing. Guys, whenever I got the revelation of who God really is, and the fact that he really does want a relationship with me, even after all the stupid crap I've done. Can I say crap? All right. No? All right, good. Good. I'll do my best. <laughs> to not. To not. It, it's probably going to come out again, though. Just saying. Um, even after all that junk, God still is like, I love you. I want a relationship with you. And when you come into this relationship with me, I'm going to clean all that up. You don't have to worry about it. Satan's going to sit there. Hey, what about this? What about this? What about this? What about this? And Jesus is like, nope. Wrong. Because the blood that he shed on this cross over this past week that we've been celebrating, that blood covers these sins. And the Father doesn't see him anymore. The Father doesn't see it. I talked last time about how Jesus stands at the right hand of the Father, interceding on our behalf. Because Satan is trying to accuse us constantly. He's trying to accuse us and expose all this stuff that Jesus' blood has already covered. 
He tries, man. He tries like crazy. So, <laughs> better than Christmas, man. It is better than Christmas. Lonnie asked me this morning, Lonnie, are you in here? Doesn't look like it. He's probably out there. I told him I was going to cover it. He's like, man, you know, I just love today. I, uh, but I'm wondering, is it better than Christmas or not? I'm like, How? I can't believe you're asking me that question. I literally have that in my notes. I said, but yes, it is better than Christmas. It's absolutely better than Christmas. What's so good about Good Friday? I heard this question not too long ago. What's so good about Good Friday? Man, Jesus is getting taken to the cross. Jesus is getting handed over by his one of his own 12 disciples. Get sold out, man. Have you ever had a friend that's like, turns their back on you? Says something that maybe you said to them in confidence? Then they go run their mouth behind your back? Or you thought somebody was your friend, but then they come out, turns out they're really not. They just want to be with you because of your money or you're funny or you have a cool car or something. That's never been like that for me. But, but that's what Jesus was going through. That's what he's going through. One of his friends that he's poured his time, his heart, his soul into says, eh, nah. You know what? Your life is worth 30 pieces of silver to me. Turns Jesus over. That's done nothing but good for him for 30 pieces of silver. It was only enough to buy a field. Wow. Mind-blowing. But why is it so good? If it weren't for what he did, we wouldn't be able to have this relationship with him. You know, only the priests could go into the holiest of holies in the temple that's where the Ark of the Covenant was. Only the priests could go in there that were, that were perfectly clean, like they had gone through all the ritualistic um, cleansing and the sacrifices and all that stuff. They were the only ones that could really get in there real close to God. You know, one time the Ark was the Ark of the Covenant. These guys are carrying it. It starts to, well, actually it was, it was on a cart, but it, it's getting ready to fall off. This dude puts his hand out to hold it up. And the dude died instantly. The power of God came out of it and killed him because he wasn't supposed to touch it. And where that thing was housed was behind this curtain that was thicker than this iPad is. Really tall all the way down. When Jesus died, it says that that curtain, that veil that they called it, was ripped from top to bottom. Not bottom to top. From top to bottom, it was ripped. So that all of us can now have this relationship. It's, a, it's an amazing visual depiction. But he did that so that we could have this relationship with him. Guys, if, if that wouldn't have happened, life would be so much more different. It would be so much different. It would not be the good life. People are like, did Jesus really die the way that, that history tells us, the way that the Bible tells us? I did a bunch of study on this. And there is a ton of really amazing, awesome stuff out there. But to be crucified... You see these pictures, like these crucifixes of somebody up on, you know, Jesus up on this, on this cross. And it's, we're like numb to it because we've seen it forever. We've seen it all our lives. We're like, oh, yeah, yeah. He came off that cross. I don't know if you guys knew that. He's not still on that cross. He came off that cross. But it's brutal, man. It's super brutal. Literally spikes driven through his arms, through his his wrist right here, it, they purposefully put it through the joints so that it, it wouldn't, like whenever he's trying to pull himself up, it wouldn't rip through the flesh there. You know, they had to learn that somehow. Let's, let's go ahead and move it down here. Just I think that might work out better. They nailed through his feet. Can you imagine? Have you ever stepped on a nail? Just stepping on one. It's like 
what just happened? Uh, you know, and then you got to pull it out or somebody else does. Man, that stinks. But somebody purposefully put his feet there and drove spikes through them to hold him there. And that's what he had to push himself up on just to get, just to get enough air to breathe. He really did die like this, guys. History proves it. Not just the Bible. People are like, well, the Bible, maybe the Bible is wrong. Maybe, maybe the Bible this. No, there are so many recorded uh, um, records through history specifically talking about Jesus, specifically showing that he truly did get crucified. When he was whipped with the cat of nine tails, it wrapped around him, and they pulled it out. It had bone and glass and, and, and shards on it, and it shredded it, his whole body, shredded it like his guts were hanging out. That's gross, man. But they whipped him with it 39 times. That's a lot. He really did die that way, though. Like, he honestly did. I don't want to focus so much on the crucifixion. It's extremely important that we know and we understand that someone suffered this much because they love us. It's very, very, very important that we understand that. However, Jesus endured that. He endured that pain, that torture, that torment, and was brutally murdered because he wanted to be in relationship with us. We've got to understand that the reason that he went and did that, the word says that he was um, silent like a lamb being led to the slaughter. He could have not gone through it. He could have summoned legions of angels to fight for him. He could have spoken. You know, whenever he said, whenever uh, ever the uh, people are coming up to take him from the garden to go, whenever they asked, are you Jesus? He says, I am. And they, Poof! just him saying, I am, literally knocked them all down. <laughs> That's powerful. I mean, I'd go around, I am. I am. I am. But that's why I'm not God, I guess. I'm not. You know, my kids, my kids wanted to get goats. They wanted to get these um, screaming goats. And I'm like, ah! I'm like, why on earth would we do that? And they're like, well, because we want to get fainting goats too. So when the screaming goats go, ah, the other ones go, ah! I'm like, that's a good stinging idea. We should probably do that. Um, but uh, isn't it funny? Doesn't God have a sense of humor? I didn't create screaming goats. I didn't create fainting goats. The God that we're serving, he created both of them for our humor, apparently, I think. I think it's awesome. So the whole purpose of him suffering like this, you know, by the next time we go over to Paul's house, for a small group, he's going to have a screaming goat and a fainting goat, I bet. <laughs> but it's probably going to be because of Stephanie. Um, the reason that he went through all this is for this relationship with us, right? But what's a relationship without free will? People in prison probably have a relationship with, with uh, the guards, but is that a relationship? Is that a two-way relationship? No. Somebody's still in prison. And they don't get to get out just because they want to. A relationship is when both parties want to be there. When both parties love one another. When both parties care about each other. That's a relationship. People are like, well, man, I wish I didn't have free will. I wish I didn't sin all the time. That's me. I say people. That's me. I'm like, man, you know, God, if you didn't give me free will, I wouldn't have to deal with all this crap stuff. <laughs> Told you. <laughs> but that's not a relationship. 
If I told my wife, you're not going anywhere. You're going to stay in there and you're going to cook and you're going to clean and you're going to, she's looking at me like, I'd get stabbed, you know, or shot probably. <laughs> I mean, I would definitely get hit with something. I don't get hit very often. <clears throat> but, but that's not a relationship, man. It's not. People are like, why? If there's a loving God that loves us so much, why are there murderers? Why are there rapists? Why are there all these people that are doing nasty, horrible things? And whenever you say it's because they have free will, they're like, what? Well, a loving God? We have a a loving God would let that happen? God loves you so much that he had to give you free will. And because you have free will, means that you can do all these ridiculous things. Because he wants you to want to come to him willingly. That's why he tells us to cast our cares onto him. Cast our burdens onto him. Take on his yoke. Take on his burdens, he says. They're light. They're easy. Take these. Let me deal with all that junk. I'll deal with it. You know, he's also the great physician. You know, he's also the one that binds up the brokenhearted, heals them, mends them, wound, mends their wounds. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? Yes, bad, horrible things happen. But when we fully surrender to him, he brings us in like a loving father. Like a loving father, like a loving, caring parent. He says, I love you. I'm going to take care of this. And then he helps us through it. He helps us get through it. And he proves why we get to have this relationship with him. Can things be bad? Yes. In fact, he tells us things are going to be bad. Most of his disciples, all but one, were martyred. They were killed because they loved him. There's a whole lot of places in this world that aren't, aren't like the United States of America. People are getting tortured and murdered every day because they love Jesus. That's it. I've said it before and I'll say it again. This is not a relationship for the faint of heart. You've got to choose. But are you willing to suffer a little bit for this amazing gift that lasts forever? Or would you rather have just this little bit of comfort and reject him and not have comfort forever? Be separated from him forever. There's a big difference, guys. Big difference. The word says that we're here today and gone tomorrow. I want to ask you a question. Have you ever felt like you've let Jesus down? I have. If you, if you care about him at all, or you've ever cared about him at all, you've probably felt like that. You've probably thought, man, I just put Jesus back on the cross. Guys, you can't put Jesus back on the cross. If he, if he had to die again, because we sin and because we let him down, he'd be on that cross all the time just because of me alone. Think about everybody in the whole wide world and all the sin that goes on in this world. Once is enough. That one time covers all of our sins. I like to think about Peter, because he kind of reminds me of me. If you guys know anything about Peter, he's hard-headed and learns slow. Um, but he's got a great heart, man. He does. But I want to talk about a little bit about what Peter, kind of, kind of some of the things. So whenever I asked, have you ever felt like you've let Jesus down? Peter's a great example of this. 
And I just picked a couple little places. I'll give you uh, some references. If you want to write it down, you can. If you want to go back and, and really look into all these and follow this progression, you can because it's super cool. But Peter, he's been in relationship with Jesus for a while now. And then Jesus is telling his disciples, I'm going to go die. In fact, I'm going to be killed pretty brutally. And some of them are like, no, I'm not buying that. This is probably a parable. Um, but, like, it wasn't. Um, but Jesus is telling them this at one point in Matthew 26, 35 is kind of where this story is. It's in multiple places, but this is the one I'm referencing. Peter swears that he will never deny Jesus, even if he has to die with him. Picture this conversation in your head. Jesus is telling them, hey, listen, um, it's about to go down, like legitimately go down. And Peter's, and he says, all of you, you're all going to go away. All of you are going to deny me. And Peter's like, not me, dude. See, that's the part that's kind of like me. Open my mouth before I think it through uh, kind of thing. And he, he denies it. He says, even if I have to die with you, hopefully this is a parable, but even if I have to die with you, I'm not going to deny you. And Jesus says, eh, actually, you are going to deny me. You're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. And Peter's like, eh, I don't think so. I wonder how much more of that conversation went on. But after Jesus said that, he, he was probably like, I'll just leave it there just in case. And then Jesus takes Peter with James and John and they go up to pray right before Jesus is getting ready to have to go be sacrificed. Right before he goes and gets murdered and tortured, right? He says, come with me to pray. Everybody else is back there praying. You three, you come with me. Probably because they were like, they were really close. They were really close. But Jesus knew that he could trust them. He had a lot on his mind. A friend of mine said, do you think Jesus knew what was going to happen? I'm like, yes. Of course he did because he told Peter he was going to be uh, denying him. He told him he had to be raised up. He knew what was coming. So he goes to the garden to pray. He's under all this stress, this pressure. He's literally feeling the weight of the world on him. He knew what he had to do, what he was called to do. In fact, there was one time before this that he says, uh, he asks his disciples, he says, should I ask that this, that this task that's been given to me be taken from me? He says, surely not. I shouldn't even ask. You know, this was a few days before this. And as the time got close, you could see that pressure just bearing down on him. Think about if, you're, if, uh, if somebody's on death row or something, they know the day and the time, the hour that it's coming, the last breath that they're going to take. He knew that too, but he wasn't getting lethal injection. He was getting his flesh ripped off and hung on a cross. Like, big difference. Still very stressful, but big difference. He takes these guys. Peter's one of them. And he says, stay here and pray. Stay here and pray. Because the hour of the time is getting close, man. It's getting so close. But Jesus had to come back to Peter three different times in the garden and tell him, wake up, dude, pray. <laughs> like I asked you to pray, I really need you to pray. So much so that at this point, Jesus is, is asking the father, if you can take this from me. He says, you can do everything. If you can take this from me, please take it. Please take it. But if not, may your will be done and not my own. I'll do whatever you ask. I'll do whatever you tell me to do. But if you can, please take it. He goes back to see his, his friends that he asked to pray with him, and they're still they're sleeping all three times. He says, can't you stay awake and pray? But their flesh was weak. I've had that, that weak flesh before. I look at them. It's easy to judge Peter and these three disciples, but it's the middle of the night, and who doesn't love sleep, you know? Like, they were tired. They just walked. They just had a great meal. And they walked all the way to the garden, and it was late. So they went to sleep. 
But then Peter, another time, like after everybody gets there and they're, they're getting ready to take Jesus, Jesus had told him to take a sword just in case, you know. Like he takes a sword and Peter's like, oh, that's why I brought the sword. They're all coming to get Jesus and Peter's like, oh, chops this dude's ear off because he's a bad aim and he missed his forehead. But he chops this dude's ear off and, and Jesus tells him, no, 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 put the sword up. He says, if you live by the sword, you're going to die by the sword. Put the sword up. That's, we don't need this right now. He says, don't you know that I can call 12 legions of angels? I don't have to go through this. I'm purposefully going through this is what he's telling Peter. Peter's like, oh, well, you said bring us swords. What the, I mean, now seemed like the right time. But then he denied him the three times. Straight up denies him the three times. But what's interesting is it says that Peter followed behind these guys. Peter, they took Jesus with chains and all that stuff, chained him up. And take it, they're taking him to go see Caiaphas, the high priest. But Peter lags back there a little ways and follows right into the court like he's not going to stand out. He's been with Jesus this whole time. And three different times, he says, I don't know that man. I'm not with that man. And the third time, he even, he even brings down a curse. Brings down a curse, says, I don't know him. And then all of a sudden, he hears that rooster crow, and it's like the light went off, and he remembered what Jesus said. You will deny me three times before morning when he says, I will not deny. I will die with you. Well, when you get to the place where that's a really good chance, and this is Peter. I mean, the dude literally just chopped a guy's ear off. Jesus did put it back on but he just chopped the dude's ear off. Like he was dedicated. We can't say Peter wasn't dedicated. He absolutely was. But then, think about, think about his heart. Think about his heart whenever he denied him. It's rough, man. In Matthew 26, 75, it says he runs off. Well, this is my phrasing. He ran off to go feel sorry for himself, essentially. That's what it does. It says that he went away Weeping sorrowfully, if you want to know what it actually says. So as soon as that rooster crows, it was like, Ugh. I've felt that. I've felt like that so many times. But then instead of going to do the things that God taught him to do, remember whenever Jesus calls Peter, he says, come with me. I'm going to make you a fisher of men. I'm going to teach you how to go bring in people. He didn't go do that. That's why I said he went away feeling sorry for himself, crying. Because he didn't go back and start doing what, what God had called him to do. What God had purposefully selected for his life. He went back and went fishing. What he was doing beforehand. Think about that. When the enemy gets to you, when Satan gets to you and he convicts you, remember how I said that, that God didn't send Jesus to convict the world? but to set them free. But when the enemy comes in and Satan convicts you and you're like, oh, well, I'm not, I'm clearly not good enough. I'm not even going to try. I'm not even going to try. Why should I? I've failed so many times. I've let him down so many times. This is just another time where I've let him down again. He's better off without me. No, he's not. He's not better off without him and you're not better off He's not better off without you, and you're not better off without him. I promise. I'm going to show you why. In John 21, 3 is where Peter goes back to go fishing, and he takes other disciples with him even. That's rough. That's rough. Takes other disciples with him. But I want you to hear God's response. Starts off in Mark chapter 16. We're going to go over verse 6 and 7 right now. And this is whenever Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of, of James and Jesus, um, and uh, Salome, they were the ones that went up to the, to the grave, to the tomb. But whenever they get up there, 
An angel was sitting inside the tomb. This huge rock had been rolled away. They covered the hole. Here's these guards. I don't know if the guards were still there, but if they were, they were like passed out. But there's an angel inside the tomb and they go in. They know that this is where his body was. They know that it was prepared and all that stuff. And this is exactly where it was. But this angel looks at them and says, don't be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He has risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him? This is where he was. He's not here. Then he says, but go. Tell his disciples and Peter. Tell his disciples and Peter. I can't help but hear and Nathan. He's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. God sent an angel to tell them. He's not here. He did what he said he was going to do. He's alive. Go tell the disciples. Tell Peter. Specifically tell Peter because he's going to need you to tell him. He's going to need you to tell him. Because he feels really bad about what he's done and what he hasn't done. So he needs to be reminded. Go get him. You'll find how Jesus restores Peter in John Chapter 21, verse 9 is where basically it starts. Peter denied Jesus three times that night. Whenever Peter, whenever Jesus was being questioned, whenever he started getting made fun of and they put a bag over his head and started beating him with sticks in his face and head and punching him and saying, prophesy, tell us who's punching you. All this stuff's going on whenever... Peter is denying Jesus at this point. So, he was feeling real bad. And Jesus, instead of saying, I told you, I told you you'd deny me, now you're just going to be a fisher the rest of your life. Get on the boat, boy. You earned this. You chose this. I told you what to do and you didn't do it. Now you're going to pay for the rest of your life. That's not what Jesus said. In fact, he comes up where they are while they're fishing for fish. Not ministering to anyone, not sharing the gospel, not talking to anybody about Jesus. They're out on the water so they don't get crucified themselves. And Jesus shows up on the shore. It says that Jesus had this fire going and he was cooking fish already. <laughs> Isn't that cool about Jesus? He's like, fish. I don't know what he did. He, I don't see him out there casting, you know, like a, a pole or anything, but he already had fish. They were on the fire and these guys are out fishing all night long and they're professional fishermen and they didn't catch anything. Imagine that. <laughs> you know, it's like, no, I'm going to go back to what I'm good at. Well, you're not good at it anyway. Just come do what I've called you to do. So Jesus, he sees him out there and he's like, hey, you boys catch anything? No, I know. Cast your net on the other side again. And they do. And they bring in 173 large fish, it says. And one of the disciples looks over at Peter and says, it's the Messiah. And he's like, what? Dives in and swims to the shore. Because he was so excited. So excited that Jesus actually did what he said he was going to do and come back to life. This was the first time he saw him. But you know he had been told that Jesus isn't dead anymore? Because Jesus told those ladies, and ladies do what they're told. He told them to go 
tell Peter that he's alive. He swims up to Jesus, so excited. And then Jesus, instead of putting him down, says, hey, Peter, I want to ask you a question. Do you love me? And you know that heart had to start stinging a little bit. He's like, yes, Lord. Yes, I love you. He had to be thinking, I know my actions didn't, don't seem like it, but I do. I do love you. I do. I truly do. And I'm sorry that I let you down. That had to be going through his mind. He says, all right, feed my fish, or feed my sheep. You know, Peter's out, out fishing for fish. But he knows that he's supposed to be feeding Jesus a sheep. He knows what he's supposed to be doing. Then Jesus says, Hey, Peter, do you love me? Oh, man. That second one, I had to feel like just a punch in the guts. And he says, yes, Lord, yes, I love you. You know I love you. He says, then feed my sheep. But Peter denied him three times. So Jesus asked him the third time. He gave him the opportunity to redeem himself. He says, Peter, do you love me? And at this point, he's breaking down. I mean, breaking down. Because Peter still thinks through a human mind. He still thinks through the mind, this mind, you know, that we all get all twisted up. So he's like, where is he going with this? Where is he going with this? He says, yes, Lord, I love you. He says, then feed my sheep. He loved on Peter. He forgave Peter right then. Well, he forgave him way before that. But he showed Peter that he forgave him right then. He, he restored him. Even though just like all of us, we don't deserve to be restored. He restored him. And Peter never denied him again. Peter went to the cross. Upside down. Crucified, tortured for his love for Jesus. Never denied him again. Ever. Man. Man. Because God didn't say, I told you so. And he doesn't tell you, I told you so. So if you're hearing, I told you so, you're not worth it. You can't do it. You've messed up too many times. That's not the voice of Jesus. The voice of Jesus says, do you love me? Do what I've asked you to do. When the woman's brought to him, being caught in the act of adultery, and everybody says, yes, she should be stoned to death. Jesus says, well, whoever hasn't sinned, go ahead. But then they all leave, and Jesus says, where are those that have condemned you? She says, they, they left. He says, I don't condemn you either. That's our God. That is the Son of the Most High God. And that's why he was sent that's why he was sent. He was not sent to condemn us, but he was sent to save the world through Jesus. That's why today is better than Christmas. That's why today is the best day of your life. It's the first day of your future. The last day of your past. Amen. That's not who you are. That's who you were. Peter did deny, but he was restored and he never turned back. We all have that same opportunity. That is the God that we serve, the true God that we serve. He's a God of restoration. He's a God that's after your heart. He's not just after your heart. He's after your life. That's why he told Peter, feed my sheep. 
This is a great relationship to be in. Do what he's asked you to do. Love on people. Love God and love others. That It's literally that simple. If you're trying to love me, it might be harder than other people. But it's really that simple. Love God and love others. Man, why did I title this? Priceless purchase. Priceless purchase. Think about that. The term priceless means that it's something is so precious that its value cannot be determined. Your value cannot be determined. If somebody puts a bounty on your head, they've tried to determine your value. But God's value for you, there's no way your mind can wrap around that. Somebody else might tell you you're worthless. You're no good. They might call you all kinds of things and tell you all kinds of things. You might believe all kinds of things about yourself, but that's not the truth. The truth is what God says about you. And God loved you so much that the first thing that he created, his son Jesus, he gave him up for you. So he can have relationship with you. Jesus gladly went. He took on that sacrifice because the wages of sin is death. Death is separation from God. And Jesus said, that's not okay. God said, that's not okay. He doesn't want anyone to perish. No, not even one, the word says. So what is purchase? Purchase is to acquire something by paying for it. So you are a priceless thing. You are priceless. Your life is priceless. Your soul is priceless to him. This relationship with him is priceless to him. So much so that he paid the ultimate price. To purchase means to acquire something by paying for it. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20 says, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? God sent the Holy Spirit, His Spirit, to live and dwell inside you. That's what the Word says right here. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. You were bought at a price. There's no higher price that can be paid for you. That's how valuable you are. That's how valuable you are to the one that saw you, thought of you, created you, designed you to be exactly who you are, to look like you look, sound like you sound, talk like you talk, act like you act. Can you believe that? He knew this was what he was going to get, and he made it anyway. It's priceless to him. When you look in the mirror, if you don't like what you see, ask God to show you yourself through his eyes because he loves what he sees. Loves it more than you, your mind can even wrap around. If you don't like what you see, guys, ask him to change your thought process. Ask him to change your thought process and see what happens. Find out how valuable you truly are. I hope that this has helped you think a little bit more about God, about his thoughts for you, about the whole reason that we celebrate this season, this, this Resurrection Sunday. Jesus wasn't just killed. He did come to life. He truly is alive today. Literally today, he's alive. This is an awesome day. Even though the weather stinks, in my opinion. I think people in Scotland would probably love it. What do you think, Mike? <laughs> it's just another day for them. But this is the day that the Lord has made. We should rejoice and be glad in it. We got to wake up and take a breath today. A lot of people didn't. All right.
listen, if anybody wants prayer for anything, wants to talk about anything, then we're going to be up here for you. If we're praying for people, let's take them over kind of under the speakers so that we can still hear. So we'll meet you over in these corners. It's going to be a little dark. We're going to play a little bit more worship music. And uh, you can stay and worship with us if you want. You don't have to. Um, but if you'd like to talk and, and all that stuff, just do it out in the foyer. If you have kids and you get home and you're like, did I forget something? <laughs> they might still be here. So don't forget your children on the way out. Um, but we love you guys. You've always got a place here. And uh, we hope to see you again. So let me pray for you real quick. Heavenly Father, <laughs> thank you, Lord, that you've paid this sacrifice. You've made this, paid this ultimate price, God, so that we can have this relationship with you. Help us to not just squander it away. Help us to not reject you, God. Give us the willpower and the desire to go after you with everything, with everything we are, God. Lord, we dedicate this day to you, our lives to you, our families to you. We love you, God, and thank you. Thank you for what you've done for us. Help us to represent you well in everything that we do, God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.